In this lecture, we're going to be looking at the pre presentation and selection of the noose. And what we're going to be looking at is what the role of the news is in media today and the different ways that the news can be constructed and selected, including news values, organisational and bureaucratic routines and sociological explanations. We'll also be looking at moral panics and the role that the media plays in the creation and growth of a moral panic. But let's start off by talking about how people access the news. So I found the Ofcom News Consumption Report for 2022. I'm sure there is a 2023 version, it may not have been published yet, um, but I couldn't find it. So when we look back at 2022, what we see is that adults, and we're, by adults they're talking about people who are 16 plus, generally get their news from the television. And that, but that is starting to decline with the growth of the internet. Radio and newspapers are on a significant decline um, as these are not generally the ways, they're not easily accessible. Um, but when we look at ages, we can see that younger um, people, 16 to 24 year olds, predominantly get their news from the internet and from social media and for that age group the use of newspapers and radio is massively declining and very much lower than other age groups but the older you get the more likely it is that the people are to get their news from the television um, and newspapers physical copies of newspapers but we do have to be a little bit cautious here because as Benson points out, it, younger people are still accessing newspapers. They're just doing it digitally rather than um, in hard copy. So we are seeing um, that there is a difference in how people are accessing their news these days. And with the plethora of sources of news, we can find what works for us. So what role does the news pay in modern, play in modern society? Now, it's suggested that the news is a window onto the world. That is a quote, and I can't remember who said it, but it, it is this idea that the news helps us to view and see the world around us. And it plays a number of different roles in helping us to see, onto the, see into the world. For example, informing us of what's happening, promoting transparency in government agencies, in um, business practices, facilitating public discourse, getting people talking, raising awareness, be that of a humanitarian event or a charitable event or issues. Providing a sense of community, giving people this idea of being a sense of belonging, because this news is part of where they live or part making them feel like by being in the know, they belong. Serving as a watchdog in terms of holding government, holding businesses, holding people in power to account. And it can also act as a cultural reflection, meaning that it can show us the, the culture of the place in which we're living. And sometimes our cultures can be so ingrained in us that we don't actually realise the, the cultural elements of our lives. Or if you are moving to a new place, it can help you to see the culture of the place in which you've lived. But the news isn't organic. It's not something that is identified very easily as being news. Now, Dennis McQuayle in uh, 2010, I think it was. Uh, oh, sorry. No, it was 1992. Got that completely wrong. Um, pointed out that news doesn't just because something happens doesn't make it news. 
it, it th there are thousands of events that happen on a day-to-day -day basis and not all of them can be reported on it's impossible to cover everything so therefore we can argue that the news is socially manufactured by gatekeepers such as editors and journalists it goes through a selection process by which these editors these gatekeepers determine if something is newsworthy okay meaning it's got enough interest or appeal to attract a significant readership or audience and it, Dennis McHale points out that there are three main influences on what becomes news how an event becomes news he talks about news values the organizational and bureaucratic routines of the media industry and the news industry and he talks about the ownership of media organizations and we're going to kind of deep dive into these three influences to see how these shape what we consider to be news and what we are presented as news and the first one we're going to talk about is news values Owen Spencer in 2008 pointed out that news values are these general guidelines or um, paradigm, if you like, to, to use a specialist term, um, which shape how much prominence, how much um, time is given over to news uh, events as news. And he said that what is determined to be a news value and the level of importance they're given is determined by journalists, editors and broadcasters. So this really does show that social construction of the news because it is the people involved in the industry who are determining what is and is not newsworthy. Now, Owen Spencer Thomas didn't come up with a list of these news values. He defined what we mean by news values. And the first people who came up with a list of. So let's talk about how the news values work. So we have Marie Holm Rouge and Johan Galt, who in the 1960s did a content analysis of Norwegian newspapers. And from that, they identified 10 news values. Now, just to reiterate, a content analysis is where you take secondary um, sources, usually newspapers, diaries, something like that, and you go through and try and find commonalities within it. So you're using that they use these newspapers and they published in the 1970s. So they did it over a number of years to identify what it is that makes something newsworthy and they came up with 10 um, and this 10 includes um, a number of different factors which i'm going to go through in a minute but in order to help you remember them i've come up with the acronym of the 10 cent cup fee 10 because there are 10 of them and cent cup fee as the first letter of each of the, each of them so the first one is continuity does the story have longevity is it going to have follow up stories? Is it going to be covered over a number of days or is it just a one time thing? Because if it's a one time thing, it's less likely to get a place on the broadcast or on the newspaper because people like to feel invested in a story. Even if they're not involved personally, they want to feel invested. OK, so. By having stories that have continuity, people keep going back to continue the story. Think about a series of books or a series on the television. You go back because you want to find out more. You want to find out what's happening. What's the next step in the saga? And the same goes for the news. The extraordinariness. Is this something that is rare, unpredictable or surprising? Because the more surprising it is, the more likely it is to make it into the news. As Charles A. Darner famously put it, if a dog bites a man, it's not news. But if a man bites a dog, that's news. And that's because it is out of the ordinary. 
the more strange, the more extraordinary the, the story, the more likely it is to make the news. Disasters, deaths of celebrity, particularly if they're young, fit into this criteria because they are unexpected. They're, they're not what is, is standard. Negativity. We like negativity as an audience. It's it's not nice, but bad news is regarded as more exciting and dramatic than good news. Um, for example, a headline of there were no murders today is not as exciting as three people were shot today. Stories about death, tragedy, bankruptcy, violence, damage, national disasters, political upheaval, extreme weather are rated higher above good stories or positive stories. And it's an element of schadenfreude. We like to feel better about ourselves because it's not happening to us. So we, we like subconsciously, this is not a conscious thought process, but we like to hear about negativity happening to others because we can kind of say, well, thank God it's not happening to us. And that's an, and it's an element of what's called Schadenfreude. Threshold. Threshold refers to the size of the event. The bigger the event, the more likely it is to be nationally reported. Anything below than what's considered national interest is unlikely to be reported because newspapers and um, television broadcasts do need to consider their audiences and increasing their audience stakehold. So they're going to go with stories that reach a wider audience. And the bigger the story, the wider the audience it's going to, to attract. Composition. So the talk we talked about the negativity, but newspapers do have to, and news broadcasts, do need to balance out their broadcasts, balance out what they're putting out there. They can't be all doom and gloom all the time because people will switch off from that eventually. So by balancing it with some good news, then we're more likely to kind of go back. So it's that idea of, yes, this makes me, this is bad, this is horrible, everything's wo woeful, but oh look, here's something that's good that's happening. And it kind of balances out the feelings and emotional response that people have to the the news of the day unambiguity now i know that sounds like it's not an actual word but it is um these are this means that there is no gray areas it's quite everything's quite black and white and they are easy to grasp there's not really more than one interpretation or if there is more than one interpretation you can take a stand to use my usual friends, phrase of it, you can't sit on the fence, it's electrified barbed wire and on fire. The newspapers don't want to sit on the fence. They want to give a viewpoint. Now, that viewpoint may be linked to what we'll talk about later in terms of the owners and the um, audience of the news outlet. But at the same time, journalists or the news that is presented needs to be non-ambiguous um, so that people can kind of get the story straight. Personalisation. So this refers to whether or not um, there is a prominent individual or celebrity associated with the story. They're more likely to be reported on. Consequently, journalists often try to reduce complex events and policies to a conflict between two people because then you've got sides. Are you on this side or are you on that side? It's about creating, putting a face to the story. So when there's no personalization to it, it's quite abstract, it's quite theoretical. When you put somebody's face to that story, there's a connection and people start feeling a connection to that story, which makes it more likely that people will read that story. We've all seen the online where um, clickbait headlines, which 
pull say that somebody said something or somebody did something we're more likely to read those stories than a headline of this happened and it doesn't have to be a celebrity or a um high pro highly prominent figure sometimes it can be um somebody who is sympathetic somebody that people can look at and go oh no this happened to them or yay this happened to them frequency this this is what dutton in 1997 calls the time span taken by the event murders motorway pileups plane crashes happen suddenly and therefore their meaning can be established quickly however structural trend changes are often outside the frequency of daily newspapers because they occur slowly and often invisibly so things that are short quick sound bitey they are more likely to make the news than something that is a slow transition because people need to see it happening elite nations this refers to cultural proximity so what we mean is that we are more like they are more likely to um report on something from a nation that is similar to our own maybe they speak the same language maybe it's a border to our own country so for example in the uk british newspapers are more likely to report on something in the usa or in australia and new zealand than they are to say in africa or asia because there is a cultural proximity to those countries we have similar cultures we have a similar language and finally elite persons and what we're talking about here is the famous and the powerful those at the top of the socio-economic hierarchy they are the ones who are seen as more newsworthy than joe blocks down the road media sociologists have noted that in the past 10 years a cult of celebrity has developed that has extended this definition of what counts as public interest to include celebrity gossip um and things of those natures um whereas prior to this cult of celebrity you wouldn't see headlines announcing somebody's divorce or somebody's um bad behavior on the front page of a newspaper now that is what sells papers that is what gets clicks on a website people want to know about celebrities and particularly when it's negative about those celebrities it's almost like we build these people up just so that we can see them fall again now in in 2001 tony Hurrup and deirdre o'neill updated the list to complete after they completed their own um content analysis of british newspapers and a lot of what they founded were very similar to what gold tongue and rouge had pointed out however they kind of put it in their own words so they talked about power elite the, the people with power people who we see as elite get news um coverage celebrity if it's entertainment worthy if it's something that's going to entertain us as much as it is going to inform us the surprise bad news and good news um and again that talk we're talking again about that composition side of things where there needs to be a balance between the new, between the two magnitude the bigger the story the more it's going to get news coverage is it relevant is this something that is happening now and this is particularly important in terms of the 24-hour news cycle that we now have people don't want to know about something that happened three days ago they want to know what's happening now follow-ups so is there that continuity of story and the media agenda what are they trying to convince us of and it's important to remember that when we talk about the influence of the media 
it does have that meat that influence on our culture on our views on the way that we view the world so the media if it if the story doesn't fit with the agenda of that particular outlet they're not going to report it or they're going to put it somewhere low down okay but this is still an accepted way that people analyze the news or determine what is or is not going to go into the news but it's not a perfect theory and Paul Brighton and Dennis Foy in 2007 published a an art a journal paper where it evaluated this idea of news values and they had three main criticisms the first being about the assumption of a value consensus sorry of a consensus not a value consensus where we now have several different types of news outlets we have the internet we have radio we have tv we have hard copy we have social media sound bites so and not all of these are going to follow the same set of values so we can't say that they all the, these 10 factors are what shape the news because these different news outlets will have different ideas of what is important and also this idea that there is a consensus between audiences and what audiences are looking for in the news people will go to the news for lots of different reasons some you've heard of doom scrolling people just kind of scrolling through social media or news apps um because it's something to do and it's all bad news and just keep on scrolling hoping for something better to come along but the the fact that audiences have different needs and news outlets have different values means that we cannot condense what becomes news into 10 factors they also talk about cult differences in cultural expectations what is considered newsworthy in one country is unlikely to be considered newsworthy in another country um, for example in mexico they may be more interested in news about um bought the border with the usa than say people in germany so these cultural expectations will need to be taken into account again in mexico there's going to be a lot of news surrounding um, Cinco de Mayo which is a, a massive national holiday that's not going to appear in Western newspapers and finally there are changes in journalism itself there is the growth of spin doctors and spin doctors are powerful individuals who shape or influence news stories to be sympathetic to their cause or their clients um, for example, since 1884, political reporters based at Parliament have been fed news by government ministers on the understanding that they do not identify this specific source of information. So that classic line of a government insider said without actually naming that person. Um, we've also seen the rise of uh, press officers uh, think, oh God, what's his name? um from covid <sighs> nope it's completely gone who was advising boris johnson um they there is an entire tv show and i highly recommend watching it it's quite funny called in the thick of it where you've got uh, peter capaldi playing a press officer for the government and they are constantly shaping and manipulating the news to make it look good for the government and that's going to influence what gets reported you've also got journalism and this is a, a, a phrase from davis in um where he talks about how we've moved away from investigative journalism we've moved away from journalists seeking out their own stories instead they are relying on um press releases wire services and pre-packaged content which they then regurgitate into news stories 
Davis suggests that up to 80% of stories found in tabloid newspapers come from these sources rather than journalists using their own um, news gathering skills. And Phillips in 2010 agreed with Davis's analysis and points to the widespread practice of reporters being asked to rewrite stories that have appeared in other newspapers um, rather than having gone out and finding that information themselves. Messner and De Satos in 2008 found that US journalists often quote bloggers who turn who in turn derive their information from uncorroborated sources, particularly rumors circulating on social media sites, rather than actually checking the sources themselves. We now have dedicated websites and companies who are fact checkers. And the number of times where reputable news sources have had to backtrack on what they've said when it turns out that it doesn't hold up. We've recently seen this a lot with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict where photos are being circulated as, as happening now. And it turns out that they were from Syria in 2008 or other places and weren't actually photographs from the current conflict. And finally, citizen journalism. Journalism conducted by people who are not professionally journal professional journalists, but who disseminate information using websites, blogs and social medias. Since the development of smartphones and social networking, the number of blogs have and uh, has increased to somewhere around 27.8 million. So we no longer have to rely on established news sources to get our news. We have more choice. And these people, these citizen journalists, are unlikely to actually follow any news values. They think it's interesting, so they are going to share it. And we do find that reputable news sources do then um, contact these citizen journalists and ask to use their footage, use their photographs, use their stories. So to say that news, what is determined to be news is determined by 10 factors. What we see here from Brighton and Foy is that maybe that's not so much the case anymore. The next um, factor that was identified is the organizational and bureaucratic routines of the news industry. Now, we do need to remember that news outlets are businesses. The production of news can be linked to what's seen as important by the organization or the bureaucratic rules that exist within that particular organization. There's the logistics of news may bias what news is gathered or how actually presented or reported. And this is illustrated in a number of ways. The first is financial. As I say, business outlets are or news outlets are businesses and they have budgets. They aren't able to necessarily send people all over the world to collect a story. So if it's too expensive, they're just saying, no, we're not covering that unless it's something massive, in which case they, they will, they will find the money. Williams also talks about um, investigative journalism, and he argues that cost cutting to increase profit has severely undermined the quality, quality of investigative journalism. He argues that newspapers investigative journalism in 21st century is largely reduced to digging up dirt and revealing secrets about the elite persons that we talked about earlier. But this could be seen as a little bit unfair because there are still journalists who do engage with investigative methods um, and do do investigative pieces. Franklin also in 97 also argues that entertainment has superseded the role of um, informing the public. So in order to get clicks, in order to get people to buy, in order to get people to watch, all of which leads to revenue will mean that they that 
these outlets will go for infotainment. Yes, they're giving you an inform information about what's going on, but they're doing it in an entertaining way in order to get you to watch. OK, and there is less of a distinction between the factual and the fictional. Um, uh, for example, um, the BBC, an Ofcom survey criticised the BBC in the early 2000s of being more Madonna, more Madonna than Mugabe. So they were talking more about celebrity lives than they were about the real issues that are going on in the world today. Um, you can see that more recently with the coverage of the royals. There's been more coverage of the royals than there has been of political instability, for example. The next um, factor is time or space available. News broadcasts have a certain amount of time. In general, uh, the BBC and ITV news are, on average have 15 items over a 25 to 30 minute period. In contrast, Channel 4, which is an hour long broadcast, has more items or goes into more depth and detail. Newspapers have limited column inches, so they're going to really be selective on what they put in those column inches. Now, the rise of the Internet has expanded the space and time available so they can you can always they can put more out digitally than they can in hard copy. Deadlines. Newspapers have to be sent to the press. They have to be printed. And this means that their deadline is usually about 10 p.m. that day for the next day's morning edition. So anything that happens after 10 p.m. is not going to be reported until a later edition that day or the next day. It's less of an issue with TV news and online editions because they can be edited and updated right up until the point of broadcast. And even then, they can still be changed on the fly. If something happens in the middle of a news broadcast, they can cut in with breaking news. And that's dramatic. And that's what gets people to then watch. Immediacy and actuality, the availability of sound bites and live footage. If you are able to get somebody on camera saying something, if you can get live footage of something that is more likely going to get people to watch, therefore you are more likely to get um, that story onto the news. For example, BBC News 24 is now able to inform the UK about news events through live streams labelled as breaking news on all BBC websites and by uploading news to apps received by smartphones. I get it on my phone where it, I will get a an alert that says breaking news. And half the time it's something to do with stock markets that I have absolutely no idea about, but it, it's considered breaking news. The pluralists argue that the presentation and selection of the news is a reflection of the type of audience they wish to attract. So if they're trying to attract a certain type of person, a certain class of people, then they're going to select their news accordingly. The Financial Times is a business newspaper. They are trying to attract people who are in the business world. So their stories are going to reflect that. The Sun is a tabloid newspaper who sees itself as the working class paper and therefore is going to predominantly give news articles that are to do with um, the working class that are of interest to the working class. You could argue the BBC is more conservative with a small c, Channel 4 News is more liberal. So depending on who they're trying to attract to their uh, outlet depends on what they're going to be putting forward and in what quantity. And finally, you've got journalistic ethics. Keeble and Mc, sorry, Keeble and Mayer in 2012 highlighted many unethical practices in some news media. Now, all British newspapers signed up to the British uh, to the Press Complaints Commission, but this is a voluntary code. It's got no legal powers. It cannot prosecute news outlets that break these break their the, this code. 
Now, we do have Ofcom, which is a government ombudsman to regulate media in general, including the press. And if and they do have the power for prosecution. Now, in 2011, the biggest scandal to engulf tabloid news happened, and this was the hacking of phones and voicemails by journalists in uh, of the News of the World, which is now a no longer exists. And this was a Rupert Murdoch newspaper in order to um, uncover gossip and salacious um, information about elite persons. Now, it became a thing. It, 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 it came to prominence because they hacked the phone of a murder victim called Millie Dowler. And she. this was prior to the fact that they knew she was murdered. She was abducted in 2002 and someone hacked her phone and accessed her voicemails. And this gave hope to the family that she was still alive because the police were monitoring her phone to see if there was any activity on it. And they saw that somebody had accessed the voicemails. So it really it gave hope that Millie was still alive. And she was by this point, unfortunately, already dead. In response to this scandal, the government set up the Levinson inquiry, which concluded in 2012. And it gave it, its outline was to review press procedures and policies regarding the gathering of information. And it came to the conclusion that there was a blatant disrespect for people's privacy and dignity and that news stories frequently relied on misrepresentation and embellishment. Now, the Levinson inquiry recommended the setting up of an independent press um, body who would make sure the press were doing its job properly. However, in 2013, the coalition government of the time rejected a majority of their findings and a majority of their recommendations, and nothing since has happened. But we can see here from these six factors about how the organisation and bureaucratic routines of the industry shape what becomes news. Now, the last part, last factor on the social construction of news is the ownership and biological bias element. Now, the pluralists will argue that um, gatekeeping process is apolitical, impartial, and journalists are dispassionate, neutral and objective observers of the truth. Because there are so many outlets, they we get a multitude of truth. However, Marxists such as McChesney in 2002 pointed out that this idea of neutrality is a myth. The media is controlled by the owners and these owners are extremely powerful. He argues that in reality, democracy is undermined by the fact that extremely powerful media owners are able to influence the socially manufactured news by shaping the editorial approach or policy of their news media. And he uses the example of in July 2007, Rupert Murdoch um, contacts with the Prime Minister Tony Blair in the run up to the Iraq war. All other non Murdoch newspapers were covering this story. But Murdoch's newspapers were not because it did not fit with his ideology. In 1988, Herman and Chomsky argued that news gathering was largely shaped by market forces and by capitalism. And he, they argued that um, in particular is the power of the advertisers built into the capitalist system. There may be a range of filters that work to shape news output, but it's all to do with that market force. Are we going to get the clicks? Are we going to get the viewers? Are we going to get the readership? Because when we get that high level of readership, viewership and clicks, advertisers want to advertise with us. Therefore, we make money.
Okay. And this leads into bagged again. I have no idea if, if I've actually pronounced that correctly. Um, writing about how capitalist values often permeate the news. For example, most newspapers have sections dedicated to business news, which present corporate leaders as heroes or exciting, and they frequently report corporate and stock market ticket information uncritically. But there's very little attention paid to ordinary people and the economic pressures they face. For example, the news seemed un seem uninterested in the growing gap between the rich and the poor. Now, you could say that that's not necessarily the case currently with the um, the, the um, cost of living crisis, but there is still that kind of we are here to sell papers. You've also got this hierarchy of credibility and Stuart Hall in 2000, uh, sorry, in 1973 um, points out that there are primary definers of what is and is not important. And these primary definers are politicians, police officers, civil servants and business leaders, those with political and economic power. And they are the ones that define if something is or is primarily define if something is or is not news. They are more likely to be given a voice than the average day Joe Bloggs. And Manning in 2001 points out that these less powerful groups who have less of a voice are less likely to are to likely to be less extreme in their views because the more extreme they are, the less likely they are to get heard. So the more powerful somebody is, the more likely they are. They have more credibility within the news and therefore are more likely to have their story told. And finally, you've got the social background of media professionals. The Glasgow University Media Group, or the GUMG, takes a hegemonic Marxist perspective and argues that the news reflects the middle class backgrounds of the journalists and editors who are creating the news. They are the ones who are determining what they're going to talk about. And this has an unconscious way puts forward this middle class view. The GMU GUMG studied news broadcasts and found out that the language and images used by journalists were more sympathetic to the interests of the powerful and the, and the middle class and devalued the points of less powerful groups. Fisk in 1987 showed that trade unions were typically presented by news journalists as demanding or greedy or taking advantage suggesting that what they're trying to do is unreasonable okay whereas any offers that the management made were put forward as offers which implies a generosity so they are in the right and the trade unions are in the wrong now one key area that we can see where news create is a creative process is the creation of moral panics now you will look at this as part of um, med uh, crime and media in the crime unit, but what we're talking about here is the work of Stanley Cohen. Now it doesn't matter if you can't remember it's Stan out of the three Cohens, but it's Stan Cohen and his work on the Mods and Rockers in 1964. And then this was backed up by Stuart Hall in the 1970s with black mug when he looked at the moral panic surrounding black muggers. Now we can apply this idea to a lot more moral panics with knife crime, Islamophobia, COVID, all of these, and obviously COVID wasn't really a moral panic, it was an actual issue, but the process was still there. So how does the media create a moral panic? And what we mean by moral panic is that it is a some a story or an issue or a group that gets blown out of proportion by the media 
So it starts off with this identification of a problem group or a problem issue. Now for Stan Cohen, it was the mods and rockers who were a subculture, two subcultural groups in the 1960s. In Stuart Hall's case, it was black African American, uh, Afro-Caribbean men. These were, this group was identified as being problematic. More recently, we've seen teens in hoodies, young people um, who are considered to be problematic groups. The media then starts publishing stories which demonize these groups. They use language that creates this idea of them being much more of a problem than they actually are. Hordes of teens, we saw this summer with um, situations that were occurring during the summer holiday. That use of the word horde suggests negativity. They then oversimplify the issue. So whatever it is that's causing the problem, they create, they take away any ambiguity from it, any shades of grey, and just make it simple. This group is bad, and these are the reasons why they're bad. It doesn't look at maybe some of the other causes, such as with teens and um, the hoodie, the, the the moral panic around teen behaviour, looking at the lack of social um clubs or youth clubs and things like that things that teens could do in their free time it just looked at teens being bad moral entrepreneurs then make statements condemning the group now moral entrepreneurs are those with power they are the ones who determine what we see as good and what we see as bad so this could be politicians police officers um all those sort of people, newspaper editors who come out, celebrities who come out with derogatory statements about these groups to continue that degradation and demonization of the group. This lens leads to police targeting of the group. So the media have pointed out this is a bad group. They need to be policed more. So the police do it. They arrest more people. They um target them, they, they talk to them, they stop and search more regularly, which justifies the moral panic because there's now more arrests. So the media, by creating this story, has created a folk devil. So that group that was initially identified at the beginning become a folk devil. They become the bad guys of society. And the media create a situation where that demonization becomes justified. But this moral panic theory isn't clear cut. And as ever, we have evaluation. The first comes from Dukes in 2015, which argues that this moral panic theory is just generally quite vague and that what they determine as being deviance isn't clear cut. But they also point out that some of these folk devils that where, where moral panics have arisen aren't always vulnerable or unfairly maligned. And Dukes uses the example of the paedophile moral panic in the early 2000s, where these people were, really were horrible people. And it's, Dukes also points out that these this theory suggests that as a public, we are passive and naive and will will believe whatever it is that the news organizations and outlets spew us. You then got Kreechner in 2009 who says that this whole theory is too abstract to be testable. We can't see if this is actually true. Creating a moral panic would be unethical. So we can't test whether or not this this process, this theory is actually true. And by retrospectively applying it to a scenario means that we can shape it to our own needs. The news characteristics also associated with moral panics, moral panic theory are very value laden and determined not by a neutrality or an objectivity, but by what the news outlet, the editors, the journalists, the owners all determine to be um, 
exciting and surprising and elite groups. The postmodernists also argue that moral panics are much more complex and suggested suggested in moral panic theory due to the diversity of media interpretations. Not all groups are going to be demonised in the press. Some, such as the paedophiles, will because that is absolutely detestable and they are um, predators. But not all social, not all groups will be treated in a demonised way by all media groups. And they argue that new media is giving a voice to those who are labelled as folk devils who can put forward their own case. And we see this a lot with um, subcultural groups such as the goths and the emos and things like that, where they are saying we are not what the media is telling you we are. We just like wearing black clothes and we're not devil worshippers. In fact, quite a few are Christian. And finally, you've got McRobbie and Thornton in 1995, who just argue that the moral panic theory is outdated. And they give four, five reasons why it's outdated. First is frequency. Moral panics are happening too often, which makes it harder to create a fervor, create a demonization, because it's just kind of like, oh, they don't like this group this week. Oh, they don't like that group this week. So the frequency of moral panics has kind of been its own downfall. The context of it is look, the people are more aware of context and they're kind of like, but is it really? The reflexivity, people change their ideas and change their minds a lot. The more information we get, the more we change our minds. So it might be that the media is trying to demonize a group, but as more information comes out, it's kind of going, OK, they weren't quite as bad as we thought. There is the difficulty to get people to join up to the moral panic. There isn't this value consensus, if you like, this consensus on views of who is good and who is bad. And finally, rebound. It's difficult for people to start a moral panic without it coming back and biting them on the backside. For example, John Major created this moral panic surrounding family values and the decline of the nuclear family only for it to come out that he'd been having an affair. Didn't really work for him in that regard. So we can see how the news can create moral panics, but maybe it's not as clear cut as it once was. So that therefore brings us to the end of the lecture. So we've, got, we've gone through how the news is socially constructed, the role of the news, how people consume the news, what news values are, the organisational bureaucratic routines and the influence of the owners, and we've talked about moral panics and how the media can create a moral panic and um, but also how that moral panic theory is perhaps becoming more outdated.